Ugh. Those darn jerks in the anime industry are at it once again, putting out banger after banger with absolutely no regard for the fact that Yazzie and I just moved and we're exhausted. I mean, the returning series alone got me feeling like a Jujutsu jumping victim here, like jumps coming in on one side with the devastating one-two punch of Demon Slayer and Hiroaka. Meanwhile, Kadokawa's practically air juggling us with Konosuba, Mushoku Tensei, Day Day Live, and synonyms for outliers at both the Demon King Academy and Magic High School. And as if that weren't enough, there's also new seasons of Sound Euphonium, Reincarnated it is a slime, the Duke of Death and his maid, and Black Butler, plus Yuru Camp, which is supposed to be relaxing. And there's a live action Odd Taxi spin off out that fing slaps way harder than I expected. When's a guy supposed to sleep off his jet lag? Now, maybe this all sounds like it's just a me problem since I'm in the very lucky position of watching anime for a living, but believe me, this affects you just as much. Cause on top of all those great sequels, I watched almost 40 new anime in the last two weeks. And out of those, I guarantee that you personally are missing out on at least one life-changing banger. But don't you worry, I'm here to help with a list of the 10 new anime that are most worth your time. These are the ones to watch for Spring 2024, brought to you by Dragon Pal. Dragon Pal is a thrilling shoot 'em up journey across a charmingly animated and delightfully distinct fantasy world. As a dragon knight, you'll ride and train your dragons to fight not just your typical monsters and mazes, but massive skyscraper climbing monkeys in abstract art deco metropolises. Along the way, you'll collect a variety of scaly steeds that grow and evolve as you summon them into battle. By drawing mystic treasures, you can eventually transform them into power powerful and beautiful anime waifus. The game's fast and responsive one-handed combat is built around a fun counter-attack mechanic that lets your dragon swallow incoming projectiles to spit them right back at your enemies. You can even eat some of the enemies themselves, too, to fuel your dragon's growth, which feeds into a roguelike system that lets you strategically combine over a hundred random skills to suit the situation at hand and the fixed attributes of your dragon of choice. Dragon Pao's distinctive art style and gameplay have already earned it pre-registration recommendations from both Google Play and the iOS App Store, plus a glowing review from Pocket Gamer. When you download the game starting April 18th, you'll get 111 free draws just for signing up, plus you can unlock four dragons for free just by clearing stages and participating in beginner events. So don't delay. Pre-register or download the game at the link below and start your adventure with Dragon Girls who can devour both your foes and your heart today. Speaking of adventures with adorable transforming fantasy girls, one of the season's best new anime is also one of its best old ones. Spice and Wolf, Merchant Meets the Wise Wolf, is a new adaptation of the classic fantasy adventure slash medieval economics lecture of the same name from the same director who gave us the old adaptation. Promising to finally finish Isuna Hasakura's incredible story after he left fans hanging for 15 long years. You might wonder what the point is of remaking the old anime instead of just picking up where it left off, especially with many of the same key talents attached to the project, but there are actually actually several good reasons to do it. First, the original anime skipped over a seemingly unimportant arc that turned out to be completely essential to the series endgame, so they had to at least redo that. And second, if you're gonna contract Studio Passion to make an anime, you may as well give him Holo at her nakedest. Plus, third, it gives Kevin Penkin a chance to rescore the entire OST. Yeah, that's the good shit. This whole anime is, actually, and even if it's good shit you've seen before, it does enough new shit with the source material while hewing much closer to the plot and art style of the books that I think it's worth going back to experience it all again. And if you've never seen it before, well, there's a reason old school anime fans haven't shut up about that unfinished masterpiece for a decade and a half now. Mm -hmm. 
Following Lawrence, the crafty merchant, and Hollow, the wise wolf goddess, on their journey from sun soaked wheat fields to the frigid north, you'll be treated to some of the most thorough and immersive low fantasy world building in anime. And you'll meet some of the best realized characters in any medium along the way. The original Spice and Wolves, one of the first things I'd recommend to anyone left wanting after the last episode of Free Run Beyond Journey's End, so this remake really couldn't have come at a more perfect time, especially given how relatively light this season is on new conventional fantasy anime. Though there is a delightfully unconventional one you ought to keep your eyes on. Train to the End of the World is a surreal rail-based odyssey across a post-apocalyptic Japan ravaged by the effects of 7G wireless. A bleeding-edge experimental cellular network capable of instantly transmitting data directly from the human brain across any distance, which may have ever so slightly broken the local laws of physics. As a result, train stations that were once minutes apart are now separated by days of dangerous travel across strange, transformed terrain. And the people at those stations have likewise been changed in various unpredictable ways, like the people of Agano, Saitama, who are all turning into animals after they turn 21. Before they meet that fate, the last four girls in the village set out on a long journey to find their missing friend, last seen in Ikebukuro at the other end of the line, with minimal guidance from a disgruntled train conductor who can teach them how to work the train, but can't actually come with them because reasons. Born from the same brilliant writer-director pairing that gave us Shiro Bako and the magnificent Kotobuki, Train to the End of the World is a show brimming with heart, charm, and Wit, not to mention some breathtakingly surreal animation. This right here is what Sakuga nerds like me live for. And that's not the only gorgeously animated original show we have to get excited for this season. Astronote comes to us from director Shinji Takamatsu, the comedy legend behind classics like School Rumble, Grand Blue, Nietzsche Bros, Haven't You Heard I'm Sakamoto, and the first hundred episodes of Gin. Tama. Though this new show is a throwback to even classicer classics that feels like it fell out of a time portal from the 80s. Harkening back to the classic Rumiko Takahashi rom-com Maison Ikoku, the series follows a down-on-his-luck gourmet chef who ends up working a wee bit below his pay grade as the live-in breakfast bar cook at a cheap sharehouse dormitory occupied exclusively by mildly insane weirdos, such as an alcoholic indie idol and the world's most deadbeat dad. <laughs> It's not all bad, though, since Takumi happens to be down bad for the dorm's mysterious young landlady, Mira, and the job presents a perfect excuse to get closer to her. Though as he does, he quickly finds more than he bargained for. See, much like Meizani Koku's Kyoko, Mira has been left all alone in the world as a widow, or Mibojin as a Japanese person, or Nihonjin would put it, which I normally wouldn't bother to explain, except in this case, it's the root of a rather plot-essential pun. She's actually an alien from the planet Mibo, specifically their exiled princess, which Tatsuki overhears her discussing with her talking alien poodle companion, leading to a series of hilarious misunderstandings. So, yeah, some of the humor here might feel a touch alienating to anyone not familiar with Japanese culture or the classic anime astronauts throwing back to, but the core premise of a house full of eccentric personalities bouncing off each other and the walls is basically universal, and few animated comedies execute on it with this much personality and visual panache, especially when it goes all in on that 80s anime vibe. Was that not enough explosions for you? Well, that's what Shonen Jump anime is for. <laughs> Kai 
Kaiju number 8 is set in a world beset by so many giant monster attacks that Japan started numbering the scariest ones like they do with typhoons. A world where only the brave soldiers of the Kaiju Defense Force, armed with weapons made of reclaimed monster bits, stand between the people and certain doom. Our hero, Kafka Hibino, is not one of those soldiers, but he does clean up after them, which honestly might take even more bravery. I know I'd rather fight a giant monster than go through that shit. Literally. Kafka would too, but he gave up on that dream long ago after failing the exam multiple years in a row, and with it his monster-slaying badass of a childhood friend whom he once promised he'd always stick by her side. When a newbie with monster-killing dreams of his own joins the kaiju cleanup crew though, and they end up saving each other from a smaller giant monster attack, Kafka finds his dreams unexpectedly reignited, only to have them immediately snuffed out again when he's turned into a kaiju himself by some sort of mini monster parasite thing. Still, he does have his wits about him even after transforming, so even as the defense force begins hunting him down, even as he's pitted against the woman he loves, he vows to use his newfound strength to protect the people of Japan in his own way, from the shadows as the newly identified kaiju number eight. Oh, that's why they call it that. I've been following the original manga since it started, so I can attest this is a beautiful story about how people inspire each other to do incredible things. But now, thanks to director Shigeyuki Miya and production IG, we've got an anime even more beautiful than that to enjoy, which somehow manages to feel every bit as cinematic as the classic films that inspired it. Go, go, Loser Ranger is an explosive send-up of the other side of tokusatsu, Sentai, that also casts a monster in the leading role, though not one of the big ones this time. Combatant D, as his name suggests, is one of the nameless skeleton-suited goons that shows up alongside each Power Rangers villain of the week to get kicked around and blown up until enough ad breaks have passed to justify forming the Megazord. It's not exactly a dignified gig, even compared to cleaning up kaiju shit, and after nearly a thousand fruitless fights against a ranger squad that killed all their alien invader bosses over a decade ago but kept the goons around because monster of the week battles are big money makers, D is downright fed up. Oi, so he hatches a daring plan to infiltrate the ranger force and steal one of their super weapons in hopes it might finally give his faceless friends a fighting chance. With a wonderfully creative hook and seriously impressive animation, both in the fights and the laid-back comedic beats, where even the anonymous mooks are given memorable personalities through how they move and act, this show is a powerful love letter to the Power Rangers that most Power Rangers Rangers fans won't even know exists because it's stuck on Hulu and Disney Plus, and they don't advertise their anime at all. Which is honestly even more disgraceful than what those bully rangers do to these poor goons. So please, do your part and watch them suffer for our enjoyment. While we're on the subject of Japan's national pastimes, there's this baseball anime that- No! Don't skip to the next section! I'll keep this short, and I promise, Oblivion Battery is worth your time. I mean, MAPPA clearly thinks it's worth their animators' time. Just look at that Sakuga in cinematography. And once you get to know the story and characters, it's clear that's not just because baseball is bigger than God over here. The series plays with tired sports anime tropes in surprisingly clever ways, surprising in part because those ways involve yet another tired trope, amnesia. Canon-armed pitcher Haruka Kiyomine and his best bud Kei Kaname were once the most feared battery in middle school baseball, until a traumatic head injury knocked all the strategy and discipline out of the star catcher's noggin, along with all his memories of their friendship and 
baseball in general. Once the brains of the operation, Kay's now reverted to his childish class clown ways, though at least his brilliant wit still shines through in his sense of humor. This anime's comedic timing is seriously impressive, enhanced greatly by all that great animation and a stellar voice cast. Your ears do not deceive you. That was indeed Mamoru Miyano screaming about nipples just now. And as the former superstars go through the beautifully rendered motions of reclaiming their lost mojo and building up their very normal public schools club full of random baseball enthusiasts into an improbably heavy hitting team, it manages to bring the hype and the laughs in equal measure. If you enjoy baseball, sports anime, or just comedies in general, this one's definitely worth keeping your eye on. Speaking of living Japanese legends like Miyano, also I kind of wish I made a Shohei Otani joke in that last section, but we have to move on. Tonori no Yokai-san imagines what life in modern Japan might look like if figures of folklore like Yokai and Mikami mingled among us mortals. It's not the first anime to tackle such a premise, but any show that invites comparisons to Natsume's Book of Friends is welcome on my watch list, and this series does plenty to set itself apart. This is a slice-of-life anime in the truest sense of the term, interweaving vignettes of various characters' mundane day-to-day -day problems, like a half-kappa girl struggling with both her first crush and the fact that blushing makes her head water boil, to paint in pieces a much bigger picture of its mystical small-town setting. <laughs> One minute, we're following a newborn Bakeneko, a cat spirit, as he and his family acclimate to life with a magic talking pet and deal with all the government paperwork you gotta do when a new sentient creature suddenly comes into existence. The next, we see the world through the eyes of a spiritually sensitive young lady stuck wishing her missing dad was dead because that would mean he could at least come visit with Grandpa's ghost instead of potentially being lost lost forever in the void between worlds. So it's a mostly cozy setting, but with a distinct sense of darkness lurking at the edges, exactly the sort of tone that you want to strike to make a contemporary magic setting feel tangibly real. Though ultimately the story's focus is less on world building and more on using the concept of yokai to demonstrate that while everyone around you is different, we're all going through it in our own unique ways. which. I think we all need a reminder of from time to time. If you're looking for a fantasy series rooted in Japanese mythology that is about the world building, though, I highly recommend Yatagarasu, The Raven Does Not Choose Its Master, a rich fantasy epic built around politics and palace intrigue that, much like Spice and Wolf for Freerun fans, comes just in time to fill the void left by the Apothecary Diary which I would like to take a moment right now to formally apologize for sleeping on last fall. Mau Mau really deserved better. But I have learned from my mistakes. These sorts of stories are always slow burners that need at least a couple episodes to properly evaluate. And with two episodes of Yatagarasu out, I'm happy to report that it looks very promising indeed. The story jumps between a lot of different perspectives to show us various sides of a heated succession conflict that threatens to tear its kingdom of magic transforming crow people apart. Founded eons ago by an ancient god who chose a golden raven to rule over his mountainous land in his stead, the eldest royal son of each generation since has inherited inherited the title of Golden Raven upon choosing his bride from one of four branch families. But this generation's a little different, because while everyone expected the clever and competent first prince to take over from his father, the second prince, son of a mere courtesan, is an actual honest Takami-sama Golden 
Raven, the first scene in countless years which the kingdom's priests have taken as divine proof of his right to rule. Brash and unconventional, in contrast to the brother who was groomed for the throne, the second prince is seen by many nobles as a threat to their entrenched power, and the way the story's framed seems to confirm those fears. See, in a clever subversion of expectations, we don't actually meet the princely protagonist until the end of episode two. Instead, we're introduced to the world through the eyes of one of his potential brides-to-be, a naive second daughter to the least powerful branch house thrust unprepared into the Tea Party battleground of the bridal rite when her elder sister is unexpectedly incapacitated. And that's followed by an episode following the prince's future retainer, the second son of a minor warrior clan from the countryside who falls into the role mostly by accident after embarrassing the rude court raven who was supposed to take it. All over the kingdom, we see lines of succession being thrown out of whack, seemingly by the forces of fate. To what end remains to be seen, but for anyone who loves fraught fantasy politics, the journey there should be thoroughly exciting. Of course, not every anime fan finds that sort of thing exciting, but for the rest of you, there's always Windbreaker. Now, I know some of you are gonna look at that title, which is not the name of the jacket, that's always a compound word, and start snickering uncontrollably. I know that because it's what I did. It is a very unintentionally funny name, especially with the faces they're making on the poster. But as you just saw in that kick-ass ass-kicking scene, this is not a shonen anime about dudes blasting each other with hyper farts or whatever. It somehow has an even more brilliant premise. Everyone loves a good old fashioned delinquent with a heart of gold. You know, that one mean looking kid who will beat up anyone anyone who threatens his friends, that is. Well, Windbreaker isn't just about one delinquent with a heart of gold, it's about a whole school full of them going around beating up a whole town full of regular delinquents. We got big burly delinquents with hearts of gold, small sassy delinquents with hearts of gold, and at the heart of the story, a friggin' tsundere delinquent with a heart of gold. <laughs> Which is the best idea you've ever heard for a character. Don't lie, you know I'm right. Windbreaker is just effortlessly fun. It had me hooked from the word go. Though, there is one more anime this season that grabbed me even harder. Jellyfish Can't Swim in the Night is a high dive exclusive, which I know makes it a hard sell for a lot of you out there, but you gotta trust me, this one is worth subbing for all by itself, even more so than Oshinoko. I have not seen an original anime that made me feel this specific kind of way since a place further than the universe. And in case you didn't listen to me or Gigak or Arcata when we were all yelling about it five to six years ago, that's a very good thing. Quite possibly the best thing. <laughs> Like Yorimoi, Jellyfish follows a four-person girl squad of diverse personalities and talents as they come together, become best friends, and help each other reach their seemingly impossible dreams. Though, instead of battling the elements to reach Antarctica, in this one they're fighting in the streets of Shibuya to make it as independent artists. Mahiru Kozuki was once a promising young illustrator, but she put the pen down forever after hearing her friends rip on one of her pieces, a painting of a jellyfish 
fish that won a contest to become a mural in Shibuya, destroying all her self-confidence in the process. In contrast, Kano Yamanochi already tasted success once as an idol, but she fell out of favor with that notoriously fickle fanbase after getting caught up in a scandal. Instead of giving up, though, she vowed to win those fans back with the power of her music alone, and now performs anonymously as the YouTube indie singer Jelly, so named for one of her favorite works of art, a certain mural that's always inspired her, and I probably don't have to tell you where the anime is going with that. <laughs> That right there was the moment I knew this would be one of my favorite anime of all time. The music, the animation, the cinematic storyboarding, the acting and art direction, it all came together to just sweep me right off my feet. And that effect is gonna be diminished by how we've had to edit it down in this video. But I promise you, if you give the actual show a chance, it will do the same for you. If it can keep up this level of quality and it's a Dogakobo original, so it almost certainly will. This anime will be talked about by people in the know for years to come. And this is your chance to get in on the ground floor and say you loved Jelly before they were cool. Do not miss it. But before you go, don't miss out on all the great stuff we have left in the bargain bin either. First up, Mission Yozakura Family is another big new Shonen Jump adaptation that just barely missed making this list. List. It's an incredibly touching spy fiction story about overcoming loss and grief and finding family in a different way from adopting adorable peanut gremlins, to be clear. But much like last year's Mashal, it suffers from a slightly underwhelming adaptation that makes me want to recommend the original manga over this anime version. Though that said, it is also stuck on Hulu and Disney Plus, so it does absolutely need all the love it can get from any anime fans interested in watching it. And so does The Fable, a show about a legendary Yakuza hitman who's forced into hiding for a year after his kill count gets a little too impressive for the local police. Laying low in Okinawa with his handler posing as his sister, the genius killer must face his greatest challenge yet, blending into normal society. It's a great premise, though this being a Tezuka Productions anime, it's one that once again is a lot better in manga form. To give you some idea just how bad Disney is at promoting these things, I've seen more anime fans talking about our next bargain bin entry, Girls Band Cry, than both of those combined, and it's not even legally available in English. The subtitles that I am able to read are also unreliable at best, so I can't really speak to just how good its story is, though it's probably great considering who wrote it, but thankfully the impeccably expressive quality of its 3D animation speaks for itself. It'd be a real shame if this show never gets officially picked up, because these visuals deserve to be seen. <laughs> Speaking of shows that aren't legally available in English yet, Blue Archive the Animation isn't quite that beautiful, but it is surprisingly good for an anime based on a Korean mobile game. Definitely worth watching if you're a fan. And speaking of Korean things, webtoon adaptation Viral Hit tells the story of a kid who gets bullied by his school's resident YouTube celebs until he decides to fight back on and with a channel of his own after a series of improbable coincidences leads to him live streaming a fist fight from his living room, which ends up going viral. Like the pun in the title, this one's story is more than a little convoluted and pretty darn silly, but it's strangely compelling nonetheless. Same goes for reincarnated as an aristocrat, I'll use my appraisal power to rise in the world. A 
Nobunaga's ambition type video gamey isekai about an aristocrat kid who uses his ability to see other people's stats to surround himself with powerful allies and ultimately, you know, rise in the world. Honestly, it's kind of refreshing seeing Akirito focus on making other people stronger instead of himself, though it's also kind of weird seeing grown adults take tactical advice from a literal three-year-old, no matter how eloquent that three-year-old is. While we're talking isekai, fans of that sort of thing who aren't put off by anime bullshit should also check out Re-Monster, a story about a cannibal psychic from Earth with the power to steal powers who gets gets unexpectedly reincarnated as a goblin, like that kind of goblin, though he does reform their society as soon as he takes over, then slowly builds an empire out of it in a manner reminiscent of reincarnated as a slime. Though Remonster's light novel did actually come first, lest anyone out there wrongly write it off as a ripoff. No one could make that mistake about a salad bowl of eccentrics, though. This charmingly original reverse isekai from the creator of Haganai follows a magical princess who gets stuck in our world world after a peasant revolt, then gets really into Detective Conan and decides to use her magic powers to help the sleazy private eye she's crashing with become an actual crime-solving super sleuth. It's a very fun show that doubles as a great tourism ad for Gifu Prefecture. <laughs> If you're looking for fantasy without any portals involved, though, there are also two pretty good ones of those this season, both of them romances by a weird coincidence. The Archdemon's Dilemma, How to Love Your Elf Bride, follows a shut-in sorcerer who falls in love at first sight with a slave at a magical auction and vows to free her in hopes she might one day love him back, though he does keep accidentally coming off as unfathomably evil in front of her because he's very socially awkward. Unnamed Named Memory, meanwhile, is about a fantasy prince who delves into a magic dungeon looking to cure a curse that threatens to kill any woman he marries, only to fall for the ancient witch who was supposed to do the curing and ask her to marry him instead. They're both really cute shows with great character chemistry and surprisingly good humor, plus deceptively deep world building. You really can't go wrong with either one. Unless you prefer your romances more down to earth of course, though we do also got you covered there in every possible category. For Yuri lovers, there's Whisper Me a Love Song, a cute little story about an excitable high school freshman and her cool singer-songwriter senpai that does appear to actually be going somewhere, though it does also put some Nozaki-kun bullshit breaks on the first episode's confession scene to make sure it gets there slowly. Yaoi fans are eaten even better this season with Tadaima Okairi, a very cute domestic romance about two married men raising their adorable, precocious baby, which one of them actually gave birth to, because I forgot to mention, this one's an Omegaverse anime. But don't let that scare you off, it doesn't stop it from being surprisingly adorable and wholesome. Hi. <laughs> That's also how I'd describe the season's obligatory harem anime, studio apartment, nice lighting, Angel Included, a show about a guy who has an angel crash land on his porch one night and invites her to live with him after confirming she's not just a crazy person. Then more cute girls show up. It's not a particularly revolutionary formula as harems go, but let's be honest, that's never bothered us harem fans before. Last, but certainly not least in the bin, is Bartender Glass of God, a re-adaptation of the classic seinen manga Bartender that, like the new Spice and Wolf, hews a little bit closer to the source material than the original. The series, as you might expect, is about a bartender, low-key the best one in Tokyo, who's able to identify the exact drink his customers need exactly when they need them. If you're looking for a mature, philosophical anime about adults with adult problems and Spice and Wolf isn't quite filling that quota for you, well, let's just say they remade this one almost 20 years later for a very good reason. Okay, whew, that was a lot of anime. I hope you enjoy at least some of it. Here's the list again, in case you need a recap. 
I'm Jeff Thu, professional insert relevant joke. Don't forget to write a joke, Jeff. And I'm gonna go pass out now. Bye.